Okay. Uh, so when when somebody wins an award, you know, like uh, in the Grammys or, you know, they win the most valuable player, the MVP on a sports team or something like that, uh, they usually have to give a speech, right? Yeah. So a lot of times those speeches go something like this. They say, you know, oh, I'm just, you know, blown away that I received this reward, this award. You know, it's just such an honor to be chosen among so many other great nominees and, you know, this false humility that comes out. Uh, and then they say, uh, and I want to take this opportunity to thank some people. And they say, I want to thank my mom and my dog and my taxi driver and my chiropractor and you know they go they have this huge list of people that they they think right uh, and so in this uh, you know they kind of go on and on about stuff and usually they're way longer than what they need to be but even though uh, that we we laugh at that one thing that we recognize is that whoever won these awards uh, they had some help along the way right they they didn't do it on their own, right? They, they didn't make it to this place without a team of people that supported them along the way. So in our passage today, we're going to see that Paul was not working alone. He had a team that he was working with. So the, the title for our message today is Better Together. Better Together. Now, for those of you that keep track of such things, uh, you would have noticed that all of the sermon titles for this series, that the sermons that I did, started with the letter S. Uh, this does not start with the letter S. I sincerely apologize if that hurts your OCD, that it did not start with the letter S. Uh, but I couldn't find a word that started with S that really accomplished what we were trying to get at with the passage today. Uh, and so if you want to put an S in front of the B, uh, for whatever reason, you can do that. So it would be better together. Um, if that makes you feel better... Feel free. So in this, uh, this week, we're in week 10 of our 10-week series in the book of Colossians. So we're really wrapping it up today. Uh, and this series was called Greater Than. And so let, let's just take a second here and let's review and go back and remind ourselves all of the different things that we saw. Uh, so if you remember, we kicked this series off looking at how Jesus was and is the means of salvation, right? So it's a relationship with him in which we receive our salvation. And then we talked about this word sanctification and how uh, once we have received salvation, then we enter into this process of sanctification, which is the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. Sorry, somebody texted me this. Let me look. Superior together. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> Superior together. So if you want to change the title... It would be superior together. I, you know, here's the thing. I knew, I get texts on my watch, and I knew, I, I just peeked down, I saw it was from Corey Short, and I knew that it had to be something incredibly important related to the sermon. So thank you for that. Uh, if you could officially change the title to Superior Together, that would be very, very good. Okay. Oh, man. I think that's the first time I've ever looked at a text in the middle of a sermon. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. I appreciate that. Okay, so back to Jesus. You know, important things. Um, so Jesus is, he, he provides salvation and sanctification. Uh, and then we talked about how Jesus is supreme and his work is sufficient. Okay, uh, so if, if Jesus is greater than everything else, if Jesus is, is greater than all other things, then we should put our trust in him. And then we talked about how uh, Paul, he focused on this idea of the mystery of Christ. And so in this uh, superiority and the su uh, sufficiency and the supremacy of Jesus, we see that he is uh, the mystery, right? And, and in him, he dwells in us. So Paul, he moves from Jesus being supreme over all of creation to Jesus living in us. So when we follow Jesus, we are following somebody that is Lord on a, on a cosmic level and on a personal level, right? which is pretty incredible. 
And we talked about within that that our identity needs to be in Jesus and, and only Jesus and not on the, the rules and the regulations that human beings come up with in, in these you know, man-made religion types of things. So these first two chapters were all about who Jesus is and what his death on the cross meant for us and because of that how we need to focus our lives on him. And so then the last two chapters were all about and explaining what it means to focus our lives living on Jesus. So Paul spent all of chapter 3 talking about relationships with each other. Okay, So that that was kind of the main focus, this idea of relationships. We talked about what do we need to take off? What are the things that we need to die to? We need to die to the old self, and we need to put on a new self, a new life, in Jesus, And so we take off our, our old sinful self and we put on uh, our new life focused on Jesus. And then, and then Paul lays out specific uh, examples of relationships in which to live this new life out in. And we see you know, a marriage relationship, a parent-child relationship, and a master and servant relationship were the examples that he used. And then last week, we saw and talked about Paul's instructions in how we are to interact with people who do not yet know who Jesus is. And so we we talked about how we are supposed to share the gospel, Uh, how we start sharing the gospel in prayer, how we share our gospel in in, in through our actions, but then how we also share share the gospel through our words. And we need all three of those things. So that brings us to our our last passage for the letter of Colossians. Uh, And so I don't know about you, but it's been really great to just work through Colossians, looking at nearly every verse and gaining new insights and understandings of what Paul was trying to convey to the Colossians then, but then also how we can apply that to our lives today. So uh, on one hand, I'm I'm ready to wrap up Colossians and move on. But on the other hand, I'm kind of reluctant because it's it's been wonderful to dig deep into this letter. Okay. So in the passage today, uh, we're going to find that this is more or less Paul's conclusion to the letter, kind of his, you know, outro. Uh, He's signing off. Uh, And at first glance, it might appear that this passage, verses 7 through 18, uh, are maybe somewhat trivial or contain minor details that we can just summarize quickly or just skip over in general. But I think if we dig a little bit deeper past the surface, we're going to find that there's some good and great truth and insights in here that that can be very encouraging and very helpful for us. So let's go ahead and read this passage. Uh, And as we read it, you can find the scripture on the screen uh, behind me in your bulletins. Uh, There's pews. There's Bibles in your pews uh, that you can use as well, and the best place to follow along is in your own Bible as well. Also, in your, in your bulletin, your blue bulletin, there's some fill-in-the-blanks. Uh, we'll get to those later on, uh, and those are just there to help you stay engaged in our conversation if those are helpful along the way. So, let's jump in here. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7 is where we're going to start, going all the way to verse 18. We're just going to read the whole thing right away. Tisius will tell you all... Tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers of the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for, and for those in Laodicea and Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her, in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write these greetings with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. 
Okay, so this passage is a little bit of a harder passage to simply take it verse by verse and talk about it, right? Uh, because we simply have a, a list of names of things that people are doing. Like Paul says, hey, there's some people that are bringing this message to you. Here's a few people that greet you, and here's a few people that I want you to greet for me. And so if we look at this passage as a whole... Uh, instead of looking at it verse by verse, if we look at it as a whole, uh, and we kind of see that there's a main idea that comes out of it. So let's kind of, let's front load this a little bit, and let's look at this main idea, and then we'll dig a little bit deeper into it from there. So, so reading this passage, we see that Paul, he lists all of these people that he's working with in working for the gospel, whether they're doing things of encouragement or prayer or spreading the word. So the big idea here is this. This is our first fill in the blank. The church works as a team to serve Jesus. The church works as a team to serve Jesus. So even though Paul is one of the most gifted men in the history of the church, he didn't do it by himself. Right? We see that Paul is not doing it by himself. He lists here 10 different people or groups of people that he has some connection to, and this is just for this letter. I'd, I'd encourage you to read Romans 16. Uh, in there he lists around 25 different people. Right? So in no way is Paul a one-man show. In no way is he a one-man show. He is all about the team. So if we run with this team idea, idea, we can say that Paul, he might have been more of a player coach. You know, he kind of did both of these things, but he certainly was not the only person involved. He wasn't the only player. He had people around him that were helping him in so many different ways. So let's just take a second. Let's look at the team roster here, okay? So first up, we have Tisius. Right? And we see he, he calls, Paul calls him a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but these three things, beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, this, isn't a, this is a wonderful example to live up to, right? These are things that we would want to be called ourselves, to be called a beloved brother or a beloved sister, a faithful minister, or a servant in the Lord. These are things that we should strive to be. So looking at this, what is Titius' job on the team, or what is his role? Basically, it's to deliver the letter for Paul and to relay his words, but then it's also to encourage the hearts of the Colossians. He's so, supposed to encourage them, so he's an encourager in this. So, Titius is the first, and then we have Onesimus. Now, Onesimus, he's going to be going with Titius to deliver this letter. Now, Onesimus is a runaway slave. Right? His, old, his master's name was Philemon, if that sounds familiar, that... That should, because there's a book, a letter in, in our New Testament that's Philemon. Paul wrote a private letter to Philemon about Onesimus uh, and in the way that they should be interacting with each other. I'd encourage you to read that uh, when you have time. So the first two, Titius and Onesimus, their job or their role is to go to the Colossians to deliver the, the word and to encourage them. Okay. Next up we have Aristarchus. Right, Aristarchus, he's a, a fellow prisoner with Paul. He's a Jewish Christian. He traveled with Paul. We, we met Aristarchus uh, last year in our uh, journey through the book of Acts, if you remember. We met him when we were in Caesarea with Paul, uh, and he, he's, he joined Paul along with his journey there. So uh, we, we met Aristarchus, and then we have Mark. Mark was the cousin of Barnabas, and we actually met Mark in our, in our journey through Acts as well. Uh, and truthfully, it's actually a little bit surprising that... Mark is included on the roster here. Because if you remember, when we went through Acts, this was a long time ago, when we went through Acts, Mark abandoned Paul and Barnabas. He abandoned, he he left. When they were in the middle of a missionary journey, Mark left. And so tension was probably high. And so likely some kind of reconciliation happened between Paul and Mark in order for him to include him in the roster, right? In order for, for Paul to see him as a valuable member of the team. And then there is Jesus, who is called Justice. Uh, and all we know about him is that he's a Jewish Christian. He's a fellow worker of the kingdom. So uh, what did, did Aristarchus and Mark and Justice do on the team? What was their role? In verse 11, it says that they were the only circumcised men that comforted Paul. So they were the only Jewish men that helped Paul when he was in prison. And so realistically, this probably meant that they were the ones that provided for Paul while he was in prison. 
Because in, when you were in a Roman prison, you relied on people outside of the, pr- uh, of the prison to provide provisions for you. Food, clothes, uh, bedding, all these things. These were not provided to you by the prison system. Somebody outside had to provide it for you. And so, uh, likely, these are the three men that are doing that for Paul. Next on, the, on our roster, we have Epaphras. So he, we met him first in the very beginning of Colossians, if you remember, chapter 1. Uh, he was the one that told the Colossians for the very first time about Jesus. He was the one that helped, to, helped them to grow in their knowledge and in their understanding. And now we see that he is praying for the Colossian church. Next in our roster, we have Luke. Luke traveled with Paul. Right? He, was, he went with Paul on this missionary journey. He was in the, in the missionary journey when, when Paul, uh, or actually when Paul was in prison, going to Rome when they were shipwrecked, landed on an island. Luke was with him there. And then we have Demas, and we don't really know a whole lot about him. So Epaphras, Luke, Demas, they were all in the same area here, working with Paul, and they were sending their greetings. And then last, Paul mentions the teammates that were on the roster, but in a different place, right? The brothers in Laodicea, uh, Nympha, she hosted a church in her house, right? And then last, there is Archippus, and it's thought that Archippus might be the son of Philemon, so there's a connection there. Uh, and Paul, what he's doing here is he's encouraging him to live out the, mis- the, the ministry or the calling that God had for him. So he, Paul recognized the gifts that he had, and he was calling those out. He was c- encouraging him to live out the calling that God had for him. So we have, have quite the list of, of people here. We have quite the roster that Paul lays out, right? And, and, and we see that he has a few that he's sending out. We have a few that are encouraging him there. There's a few that are working in the Roman area. And then there's a few that are working in other parts of the world. So we see that everybody here has a role on the team to serve Jesus, to serve each other, to serve the world, right? And the same goes for the church today. Everybody in the church is on the same team, and everybody has a role to play on that team. Right? So God has given each one of us, he has given us gifts and talents to use on this team. But sometimes we see that not everybody is willing to use those gifts and talents for whatever reason or whatever excuse. Right? And, and we have seen this so much so in recent church history that people have actually uh, developed what they call the 80-20 rule. Has anybody heard of this? The 80-20 rule? The 80-20 rule is the idea that 20% of the people in the church do 80% of the work. 20% do 80% of the work. That means that 20% are doing the work, 80% of the people left are coming to church, sitting in the pew, and never really getting involved. And the problem with this, the problem with this, is that that means 80% of the team is sitting on the bench. 80% of the team is sitting on the bench. They're not even in the game. 80% of the team isn't even in the game. That's a huge amount of the team. I don't know any team that can win any game by using 20% of the team. Dennis Berkey, did you ever play 20% of your team and win a game? Never. So first and foremost, we have to establish that if you are a follower of Jesus, first of all, you're on the team. You made it. You didn't get cut. You're on the team. And if you're on the team, you're expected to play. If you're on the team, you're expected to play. So the church works together to serve Jesus. And so based off of that, that idea of the, work, the church works together to serve Jesus, and what we saw in this roster, there's some specific things that we can, can talk about that we see that the team is doing. So let's take a look at this. This is the next fill in the blank. The, the team focuses on comfort, help, and encouragement for others. So first we see in, in verse 8 that Titius, he was sent in order to encourage the hearts of the Colossians. So he is encouraging them. He is lifting them up. That's a big part of his role at this moment on the team. And then in verse 11, we see the Aristarchus and Mark and Justice. They are the ones that are comforting Paul, and they are helping him while he's in prison. And then in verse 17, we see that Paul is encouraging Archippus to live out this calling that God has given him. 
So we see that, that comfort and encouragement, these are really important things within the church. Right? This is the culture or the DNA that the te- of the team that they are wanting to build. Right? One where people take care of each other, one where people look out for each other. And so we have to ask ourselves that question of what teammates am I encouraging? Or what teammates are encouraging me? What teammates am I serving? What teammates are serving me? So are we serving and encouraging others, but then also are we open for others to serve and encourage us? Right? Because sometimes it can be harder to receive encouragement and to receive service from other people. Right? But we see that Paul mentioned three guys that were doing this to him, and so if Paul can do it, so can we. But also the fact that Paul is receiving this encouragement, he's receiving this service from others, it just goes to show again that this is not a one-man show. Paul is not the only person doing this. He needed people. He needed people to comfort him and encourage him, and then he sent others out to comfort and encourage even more people. So we see that the team focuses on comfort, help, and encouragement from others. Let's look at the next thing that the team focused on. The team focuses on prayer and discipleship. We see in verse 12 that Epaphras, he is always struggling on your behalf in his prayer. So basically, it's saying that Epaphras here, he's a man of constant prayer. He is praying specifically for the Colossians and the Laodiceans. uh, And this is one of the ways that he is caring for them. He is praying for them. And then verse 12, it tells us what he prayed for. It says that he, he prayed that they may stand mature, fully assured in all the will of God. So he wants them to continue to grow in their relationship. He wants them to continue to mature in their relationship with God and in their understanding of God and his will. So we see that these these are two things that the church is also focused on. These are two things that we need to focus on. We need to be focused on prayer. We need to be praying with and for each other. And so we can ask the question, do you have people that you are praying for? Do you have people that are praying for you? And so within that, the church needs to be focused on discipleship or the idea of growing deeper and stronger in your relationship with Jesus. And so what are you doing in your life to learn and grow? Are you digging deeper into the scriptures? Or do you have people in your life that are holding you accountable to your, to your practices and your actions? Are you seeking ways to grow closer to God on a daily basis? And if the answer to that question is no... You have to ask yourself, why? What has caused you to become stagnant or complacent in your relationship with Jesus? So the church is about prayer and discipleship. Now, there's times in in the church, especially a church that's growing, that it's easy to get caught up in and consumed by numbers, especially uh, attendance numbers, right? People say, there was how many people in church on Sunday? Oh, that's low, or oh, that's high, right? Now, those numbers really don't mean anything if the people that are coming in the doors are not gaining a depth or growing in their relationship and in their knowledge of God. Those numbers don't mean anything unless people are actually growing deeper when they walk in those doors. Right? There's a lot of churches that uh, they are out there, they, they have this debate with each other of whether the church should be, well, we should, we should focus on outreach or we should focus on evangelism uh, and bringing people into the church, or no, 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 we need to just focus on discipleship. Right? They, they almost think they have to focus on one or the other, and I guess I would push back on that whole debate and say, shouldn't the two work together? Right? The more that somebody or the more that people are discipled and they grow closer to Jesus in their relationship the more they are going to want to and be willing to reach out to the people they know, to their neighbors, their friends, and tell them about Jesus. Right? So the church should be focused on both discipleship and outreach. But good discipleship often leads to more outreach. This actually brings me to the next point that the team focused on. The team focuses on reaching the world. The team focuses on reaching the world. We talked about this a lot in our, uh, at our service last week on Saturday night back at the cabin. Right? So the, the, the team focuses on reaching the world for Jesus. And so what I just applied uh, just a second ago applies here too. Good discipleship leads to reaching the community and the world for Jesus. 
So the church needs to be focused on reaching out to the community and to the world, to telling other people about Jesus. It's as simple as that. To use their words, to use their actions, to tell other people about who Jesus is. We know that Paul, he went about from place to place, so many different places, with the goal of sharing the good news of Jesus. And we know that he wrote letter after letter to different places to share the good news of Jesus. So in all, in all of those visits, in all of those letters, he's sending, he's sending these out. He's sending other people out to do the same. Paul is working at growing the team. He's working at growing the team of bringing other people to know Jesus. So for Paul, the team was the people that he mentioned by name. The team was the church in Colossae, the church in Laodicea, the church in Heropolis, the church that met at Nymphus House. This was all the same team. These weren't different teams. I think sometimes in our modern church we get confused about who is on our team and who the competition is. Because the team that we're talking about today is not just Shore Church. I think sometimes the, the, we start to think that the local churches around us are the competition, not the teammates. Right? Sometimes we, we get that mindset, right? And that, that's just plain wrong, right? Because the team includes every Christian in the world, right? We're all on the same team. We're all teammates. We all have a common goal of seeing more people know Jesus. And so if that's the common goal, shouldn't we work together in that goal? I, I really love the fact that we have joined forces with two other churches, Emma Church and Marian Christian Fellowship, to do our Bible school, right? We just saw that. There was two other churches that joined us here this past week. And so that's three churches, three different sets of gifts, the same team, the same goal, working to disciple and reach over 100 children. Right? That's a picture of what the team should look like. So I have two challenges for you uh, in, in this idea of thinking that the team needs to focus on reaching the world. The first is who is somebody in your life that you, don't, that you know doesn't know Jesus, they don't have a relationship with Jesus, and you'd like to see that change? Who's that person in your life? Maybe there's one, maybe there's ten, maybe there's more. How can you talk to them about Jesus? How can you talk to them about Jesus? But also, can you invite them to join you here? Can you invite them to church? Something interesting that I saw this past week from the Billy Graham Association, according to a national survey that they did, 82% of people that don't go to church, so they surveyed people that didn't go to church, the 82% of people that said they didn't go to church said they would come to church with a family member or a friend if they were invited. 82% of people, if they were simply invited by a family member or a friend, they would come. So I'm sure each of you knows at least one person that doesn't know Jesus. And I bet you, if you would talk to them and invite them, they'd probably come with you. 82% of people. Now, one person can't invite everybody, but everybody can invite one person. And I realize that bringing somebody to church does not save them. Right? Walking in those doors doesn't save you, but... Getting somebody in the doors of the church gives them a great opportunity to have an encounter with Jesus, to have an encounter with a Christian community, to be and feel belonging to something, and to encounter the risen Savior. So we need to be reaching the community and the world for Jesus. So that's challenge number one. Challenge number two is I want you to think about how you can support the whole team, not just short church. How can you support the whole team? Do you pray for other churches in our area? Do you pray for their pastors, for their people, for their activities? Or maybe there's other ways that you can partner with other churches, Shore Church and other churches partnering in certain things in which our gifts align or our focuses align. The team must be focused on reaching the world for Jesus, and we have a way better chance of doing that if the whole team works together. So the church works together to serve Jesus. And in that, our focus is encouragement and help, prayer and discernment, and reaching the world. And so as we go into our our last song for today, I want you to be thinking about your position on the team. What is your role on the team? Has it been an active role, 
or has it been a passive role? And if it's been a passive role, why is that? Maybe that's something you want to change, right? We don't want 80% of the church sitting on the bench. We want 100% on the field playing all the time. What is your role? What is God calling you to do? What has he equipped you to do? And so during this song, our our elders are going to be spread out in the sanctuary. Uh, They would be happy to pray with you. If you need prayer uh, to seek out what your role is or or you need God's strength to to live that out, uh, anything, the elders would be happy to pray with you in that or I'll be up front here. So as we reach the end of our journey through the book of Colossians, uh, this is a letter that's focused on the greatness of Jesus and how we should live because of that. What better way to end this journey than to uh, be reminded that we're all on the same team, to be reminded that, uh, uh, that reminding each other that Jesus is our only focus, that Jesus is the center, reminding each other that Jesus is the one that we need to turn our eyes to and we need to be carrying on his work. Go team. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for each person that's here. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the way that you speak to us through it, uh, even in passages that uh, may not seem like there's as much there for us to get. Lord, you reveal more and more each time. So Lord, I, I ask that as we go from here that you would show us how to work as a team to serve Jesus. Not just short church, but the church across the world. Show us how to work as a team to reach the world, to encourage each other, to pray for each other, to disciple each other. Lord, may we be your hands and feet. In Jesus' name, amen.